it is because of bulging interventricular septum into the right ventricle due to severe LVH and because of very high pressures that are generated uh, within the left ventricle, this can result in a bulging interventricular septum into the right ventricle. With HCM will be asymptomatic at presentation and it could be an incidental diagnosis and patients who present with symptoms most often presents with dyspnea. So the most common symptom in a symptomatic HCM is going to be dyspnea. The reason for dyspnea is diastolic dysfunction and increased left ventricular and diastolic pressures. Because of that you can have increased left atrial pressures and pulmonary venous pressures resulting in pulmonary congestion and dyspnea or it could be due to MR itself. MR we know it's due to either SAM or probably due to leaflet and papillary muscle dysfunction itself. And one fourth of the patients who have symptoms will have angina. Angina can happen even without coronary artery disease, usually due to demand supply mismatch. Patients generally tend to have very high demand because of the left ventricular hypertrophy itself and they tend to have more ATP consumption because of increased myosin actin cross links at resting state. And the supply can also be less. Even without a CAD, the supply may be less because of microvascular dysfunction, that is small vessel disease, and the patients can have myocardial bridging. Because of that also, the supply can be substantially less. And patients can develop arrhythmias also. Interestingly, the most common arrhythmia in HCM patients is actually atrial fibrillation, which happens in 20 to 25 percent of the cases, which can result in palpitations and thromboembolic manifestations. And uh, remaining patients can develop VTVF also which can result in syncope and sudden cardiac death. And coming to physical examination, which is very important for your exams, the pulse of HCM is classically of bisphyrians character, or more appropriately we can call it as a jerky character or jerky pulse. So what do you mean by uh, bisphyrians and jerky pulse? In bisphyrian, the classic bisphyrians pulse, you'll have two peaks in systole, and both peaks will be equal. Typically seen in a patient who's having a severe AR, or a patient who is having a AS and AR together. So, it is never seen in a patient with severe AS. In severe AS, you are going to see an anachronic pulse or a pulse is parvus at TARDIS. But in severe AR and a patient who is having AS and AR, you are going to classically see the bisphyrians pulse, where you have two peaks and both the peaks will be equal and both the peaks will be seen in systole as well. Whereas in HOCM, especially obstructive forms of HCM, that's what I mean, you are going to see a kind of bisphyrians pulse only but you will be seeing two peaks that are not equal the two peaks will be in systole only but they won't be equal the first peak will be a little bigger the second peak will be a little smaller the reason for that is uh, during the mid to late systole we know the velocity of flow will be very high against an obstructed lvot so there will be a uh, drop in pressure and that creates a venturi effect that sucks the mitral apparatus towards the LVOT that's going to cause that SAM, systolic anterior motion that's going to obstruct the LVOT more so that there will be decline in the blood flow. And once again, once the velocity of flow reduces, your uh, pressure drop will not be that great and the venturi effect will resolve to some extent and then mitral comes back to its original position and the LVOT will be relieved of obstruction and then the blood flow will increase again. Okay, so this will tend to produce this kind of a classic jerky type of bisphyrians pulse. And the carotid pulse will have a brisk rise and then there will be a sharp decline and there will be a slow second rise as well. And both the peaks will be in systole. So this is a classic jerky pulse, which is a kind of bisphyrians pulse that happens in patients with obstructive forms of HCM. And because of the same uh, you know, like physiological changes or pathophysiological changes that happen at the LVOT that produces this bisphyrian pulse, you can also get something called as a double apical impulse or even a triple apical impulse. The same phenomenon. Initially, there will be a uh, LV, increasing LVOT obstruction that reduces the blood flow and again, there will be a second increase in the blood flow that produces bisphyrian pulse can also result in something called as double apical impulse. So in exam, when you see the double or triple apical impulse, you usually go for diagnosis of obstructive HCM. And usually because of LVH, the epical impulse will be of heaving or sustained type. And what will be the JVP? Most of the times the JVP will be completely normal in patients with HCM. But some patients can have a prominent AVIP because of an effect called as Burnham effect. 
and this is due to right ventricular involvement. How the right ventricle can be involved in left ventricular hypertrophy? It is because of bulging interventricular septum into the right ventricle due to severe LVH and because of very high pressures that are generated uh, within the left ventricle, this can result in a bulging interventricular septum into the right ventricle and that can result in reduced right ventricular complaints which can actually produce a prominent A wave. If you have a prominent A wave because of severe LVH, that is called as burning effect. That can happen rarely and this is an exam question. Burning, burning effect can happen in patients with severe aortic stenosis also. And coming to the heart sounds, you know the second heart sound is composed of two things, A2 and P2. Because of significant LVH and LVOT obstruction, the left ventricle is going to contract for a longer period of time, displacing the A2 very close to the P2. So because of late A2, in patients with HCM, and this can happen in patients with severe AS also, but in patients with HCM also, you can have late A2 because of sustained LV contraction. You can have a narrow split. And in very, very severe cases, the A2 can move farther than P2 because of sustained LV contraction. And that can result in paradoxical splitting or we can call it as reverse splitting, which is a marker of severity in both HCM as well as aortic stenosis. So, it's a marker of severe LVOT obstruction. And many patients will have fourth heart sound. We know fourth heart sound is a classic sign quinone of a LV diastolic dysfunction. So whenever the atrium contracts against a stiff ventricle, you are going to result in development of fourth heart sound. It's very common in patients with HCM and aortic stenosis. And coming to the murmurs, it's one of the classic areas that you will be uh, asked in your need SS exams. And the murmur of obstructive forms of HCM is going to be typically of uh, ejection systolic murmur type. And it will be of crescendo, decrescendo type as well. And the maximum intensity of the murmur will be in the left lower sternal border. Remember, iatrogenous murmur will be best heard in the right upper sternal border. But HCM murmur will be best heard in the left lower sternal border. And the murmur is basically due to LVOT obstruction. We know that an LVOT obstruction per se is going to be dynamic, which is load dependent and contract dependent. Likewise, because the murmur is due to LVOT obstruction, it is going to be dynamic, again dependent on load and cardiac contractility. And HOCM murmur is one of the most dynamic murmurs you can ever hear in cardiology. That's why it's a very, very important topic for the exams. And remember, the obstruction and gradient is going to increase with reducing preload, reducing afterload, and increasing cardiac contractility. And because of the same, the same conditions are going to increase the murmur as well. And what are the conditions that reduce the preload? Bulls alva standing diuretics. And what are the conditions that reduce afterload vasodilators uh, like uh, nitroprusside or amyl nitrate inhalation? And what are the conditions that increase cardiac contractility, exercise, and post-PVC, especially in the cath lab, can increase cardiac contractility, which can increase the obstruction gradient and can increase the murmur as well. And what are the conditions that's going to reduce the murmur? The same condition that reduce the obstruction and your LVOT gradient, like increasing preload, which is usually achieved by leg raising and squatting. And conditions that increase afterload also can reduce the uh, LVOT obstruction gradient and can reduce the murmur. The best example for that is going to be isometric hand grip. And remember, MR in patients with HCM also can result in the development of murmur, systolic murmur at the apex. It could be either mid to late systolic murmur if it's just due to SAM or it can produce a whole systolic murmur also if the leaflet or papillary muscle is involved. And coming to the diagnostics. Music